Moving on, we're now going to welcome up to the stage three uh, other panelists who are going to be talking uh, more on the business models uh, side of, of the mobile internet. Um, Marco Gutierrez is the Chief Marketing Officer uh, of American Mobile. Uh, we have Nathan Eagle, who is the founder and CEO of uh, Jana. Uh, and we apologize, but our original panelist, Chris Daniels from Facebook, was, was unable to travel. But we appreciate it at short notice, Peter uh, Bethos, the Chief Commercial Officer at Globe at uh, Telecom in the Philippines, being able to, being able to join us. So please welcome them all. So, Marco, I think you're going to start us off with uh, some remarks. Okay. Are you going? I represent America Mobile. We are operating mainly in Latin America. Uh, we serve 270 million customers. And uh, I would like to, first of all, to talk about the problem. And afterwards, we'll talk about the solutions and the business model. Uh, here, today, 60% of our customers, they use data services in some way. 60. SMS, for example, is 95. Voice, 98. From those 60%, 25% are smartphones, 35% feature phones. Yes, feature phones, they are still the majority. The smartphones, since uh, 2012, they, our customer base grew, grew uh, uh, 4.6 times. It's incredible. But this is still 25% only. Our data users, they grew 80% only during those years. And the worst part for us, mobile operators, is that the data revenues grew only 40%. So, and this is part of the problem. This is not a sustainable model for the future. Traffic growing two times, revenues growing 40%. So we need to find a solution. And the solution depends very much on all of the, the players, not only mobile operators, not only uh, Facebook or Google, it depends on everybody. So we are here to discuss how we can find solutions to have a sustainable model for the future. For sure, the, the first part of this panel, talking about technology, efficiency, is a key part of the contribution. We need to decrease the costs of the network. We need to decrease the cost of deploying coverage. And they are doing a good job, I would say. But we need to do more. Governments need to help as well. And I have seen some governments that they are doing really good things. They are cutting taxes to help coverage, or they are offering licenses for, for G, 3G uh, with a less cost, but you need to commit to a certain coverage. This is really smart, because they are doing their part as well. They are incentivating to the, the investment that we will generate more coverage, more, they reach more people, they increase the GDPs, and so on. But no, uh, not all of the governments are doing the same. And I'd like all of them to think about it. It's 
to incentivate coverage, incentivate more, uh, to, to reach the 20% that are not reached today, and to cut taxes on certain devices that we will help people to achieve, to, to access the internet. Us, mobile operators, we need to work on that as well. We need to think about new models to offer access to our customers. We cannot charge $50 per customer and thinking that they use internet. Most of our customers, they don't have $50 to spend every month. Actually, they have seven, nine dollars. So we need to find ways to allow that customers with this amount of money to be able to access internet. And some operators, they have done good things. A daily fee or offering services for free if the customer reach certain conditions or things like that. We need help from the internet players as well. We need help from Google, from Facebook, from WhatsApp or from everybody else. Because we need more money coming from the ecosystem to sustain the growth of the networks as well. And we need new players that can help us as well. And Jana here is a good example of this. Uh, so, it, the solution is not simple, but we have, if we all work on that, we can achieve because we have some paths that we know that they work. So we need to learn, correct our paths, and then ensure that we achieve our goal that to, to reach 100% uh, of penetration of mobile internet. I remember when this show was in, in Cannes that we were happy because we had achieved one billion subscribers in the world. With GSM, there was, for those that were there, there was a boat from Siemens showing one billion, one billion, one billion. And uh, we have achieved one billion, now we, we have achieved 3.4 billion according to GSM numbers. So I'm sure that if we work together, we can achieve the next billion or the next two billions, or the next five billions, or whatever. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco. Uh, Nathan, do you want to give uh, some brief opening remarks on Jana um, yourself? So uh, I, I may kind of lead off with uh, just kind of setting the stage a little bit. Um, you know, one fact that I think is important to keep in mind is that there's, there's about $200 billion being spent right now on advertising in these emerging markets. You know, that $200 billion, is, you know, it's primarily going into the pockets of the people who own television channels or radio stations or billboards, um, but it's a huge amount of money, right? And it's growing um, at something like 15% a year. Um, the other stat that I think is important to keep in mind is that these these massive global brands who are pushing all this money, these $200 billion a year, into these markets. Um, they're going after consumers who are, you know, a little bit different, or they have certainly some differences than the traditional middle class consumer in, in North America or Western Europe. You know, while, while mobile phones are, are ubiquitous amongst the middle class globally, um, middle class consumers in emerging markets, they, they spend upwards of 10% of their day's wage on mobile airtime. And so that's the other fact to keep in mind. So these consumers, they're spending an extraordinary amount of money relative to their total income 
um, for the privilege of using their handset, right? For the ability to communicate with their friends and family. Um, and uh, and it's hard, right? I mean, the, the operators are in a tough position because they want to invest in you know more infrastructure, which takes a ton of capex. Um, and yet, they know that like the these these consumers are already paying as, as pretty much the max that they uh, they can't afford to pay. And so, no matter how targeted a service we can provide, um, you know, there is a real upper bound for how much we're going to be able to get a uh, woman living in Jakarta to pay for her mobile phone. Um, so as a company, what we've tried to do is address those, those issues um, by integrating with mobile operators uh, and enabling global brands to basically be able to engage directly with consumers and help offset that inherent cost of using the phone. Right, so we basically built a compensation platform. We've integrated now with 237 mobile operators. We're live in 102 countries. Um, and we can do something that I, I think actually is quite profound. You know, we can instantly put money into the pockets of 3.48 billion people, 3.48 billion uh, active subscribers uh, in denominations as low as 10 cents and virtually friction free. Um, and so that's, that's the technology that we've built to, to address this problem. I might step back a little bit and talk a little bit more about the context um, and the rationale for why all of this money, this is a panel on business models. And from my perspective in emerging markets, um, the biggest pile of money on the table right now is this $200 billion pile. Uh, and the reason why it's so big is that, you know, these global brands, and, you know, clients range from Microsoft and Google to, to P&G and Unilever, but they all know across different verticals that their future revenue and earnings growth they're not coming from they're not coming from Spain, right? It's not it's not coming from America for that matter. But future revenue and earning growth across most global brands, um, it's the same usual suspects, right? It's Brazil, it's India, China, Latin America, Indonesia, um, and uh, already for Unilever earns the majority of their revenue now in emerging markets, and um, and this is this is a trend that is going to kind of continue uh, over time, and not just over the CPG companies, but but on the, the digital players as well. And, and so, so everyone's doubling down, down right? right? And, and uh, what's, what's exciting, exciting is we're at this point of economic flux um, that you know, I, I feel, feel like is, is legitimate phase transition, transition is a tipping point. point. I mean, we've, we've never, never seen in human history this much economic change. change. You know, the, the global, global GDP, GDP right now is something like $75 trillion. trillion. Um, by 2050, by the end of my career, it's going to be uh, north of $380 trillion. So we're going to see a growth, you know, a growth of $300 trillion uh, over the next a few decades. And that growth, I mean, it's coming from these markets, right? Um, you know, if you look at the top 10 largest economies in the world today, you know, a lot of them are on this continent. Um, but if you look at um, the, top, the top 10 largest economies by 2050, uh, it's going to be a radically different list. The world will be, you know, radically different. You know, the, the top 10 global superpowers um, are going to be, you know, include Mexico. You know, Egypt is going to be in the top 10. Um, Indonesia is going to be in the top 10. The fastest growing economy over the next few decades is actually Nigeria, um, with a population that's going to be doubling. So there's, there does feel like a gold rush, and there's a lot of global brands who are really excited about trying to figure out how do you engage with these consumers. Um, but these consumers, you know, they're, they're different, and they're spending a ton of money on, on their cell phone bill. Um, we built a platform to try to facilitate that relationship. And one of the things, you know, we have failed across the board in a lot of different ways. Well, you know, but it's, it generally we're failing because we're assuming that these consumers, uh, we treat them kind of like consumers uh, who live in North America. Um, so when they sign on to our platform, we ask them for their email address. Um, and they, they type in their email address. And, um, uh, and then we send them basically the same thing that virtually every web company does. We confirm their email address by sending them an email and giving them a little link to click on. Um, what blows my mind is that a large fraction of our users, they don't want to click on the link, right? They, and, and the reason is because they don't want to consume the data. Um, they, you know, so they'll send us emails back saying, hi, this is me. Um, you know, this is my confirmed email address. But, um, but, but they're very reticent to actually use any data that they don't necessarily have to use. Um, and I think that's a really important point. Is when we're starting to talk about trying to market to these next billion consumers um, via the mobile phone, you have to be cognizant of the fact that every banner ad you're pushing that person, right? Every video you're getting them to watch, every survey that you're having them take, you're taking money out of their pockets, right? They're paying for every bite. Um, and so you really need to make it worth their while in order for them to really want to engage. 
Um, but when you do, when you do make it worth your while, and when you're able to start offsetting that cost, that inherent cost that you're asking them to incur by using the data plans, um, you get extraordinary engagement. And we just uh, we did a campaign with Unilever in Indonesia last week. Uh, it was just you know it was two days where we, we told 100 people in Jakarta um, about this three-minute long-form video. Uh, it was for a Project Sunlight to talking about the benefits of hand washing, and then we had them fill out a, a lengthy 10-question survey and then share it with their friends. We told 100 people this, um, and then within 40, 48 hours later, we had hundreds of thousands of people in Indonesia who have watched the video, uh, filled out the survey, and shared it with their friends. And, and the reason why you know, we didn't spend a dime on advertising, the reason why it worked is that we, we were offsetting the cost of that data that they were consuming. So when they, when they watched the video, when they filled out the survey, they gave us the data, we gave them something back. You know, there was some inherent reciprocity there. Um, and boy, that scales. And that scales far better than putting more money into the pockets of people who own billboards in that Indonesian community. Right, so that's, um, I think that's, that's ultimately, as a company, what we're trying to do is, is rethink the way advertising is done in these emerging markets. Um, and, uh, and it's exciting that we are, you know, we're working now with the most, most of the top 10 largest advertisers in the world, and we just have uh, Maurice Levy, who runs a company called Publicis, has just joined our, uh, joined our board. And you know, Maurice controls a substantial fraction of that $200 billion that's going right now into the, 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 the you know, pockets of people who own things like billboards. And what's exciting is that if, you know, if we're successful, if, that, if this hypothesis is correct, uh, and we can redirect a substantial fraction of that $200 billion away from the media owners, away from the people who own those television channels, and directly into the pockets of the very consumers that these large global brands are trying to reach, we can take the average amount of spend that, that, that consumer spends on uh, their, their mobile phone from 10% of their day's wage to 5% for a billion people. Ultimately, giving a billion people 5% more money. And you know, our operator partners love this because that's 5% more money they could spend on airtime. Our clients love it because that's 5% more money they could spend on shampoo. Uh, but from you know, our company's perspective, we could care less what, what these billion people spend 5% of their, you know, their income extra income doing. Um, it's all about economic empowerment. And you don't get many opportunities to be able to provide a billion people with a 5% raise. Um, but uh, because of these kind of market forces, uh, and, and the, the fact, fact that, that mobile phones, phones have become ubiquitous, I think, uh, I think we've, we've got, got to find a chance. So, thanks. Thanks, Anthony. Um, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I'd like to uh, thank everybody for inviting me here today. It's late. Uh, and if you're like me, actually, the more engaging part of these things are the, the chats and the discussion afterwards. So I'll try and be brief. It's, Kind of humbling as Globe Telecom to be up here on stage. My friends Manoj from Airtel and American Mobile and, and Ericsson and large, uh, very large multi billion dollar companies. So you might be wondering, uh, uh, what am I doing up here? And oftentimes I wonder the same thing. Um, but let me tell you a story, a uh, very brief story. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apologize in advance because the story isn't finished yet. Let me tell you a story of why the Philippines might be an interesting place to think about when we think about connecting the next three billion people. And let me tell you the small role we're trying to play in that journey. Um, Philippines is an amazing place. The tourism slogan is more fun in the Philippines, and I've been there for four years, and I can tell you that is definitely the case. Um, but it is more fun for not just uh, tourism reasons. Uh, from an industry perspective, if you look at the Philippines, uh, we're not India, we're not Brazil, but there's 100 million people that live there. Um, it's the second youngest country in Asia, uh, next to Laos, and uh, Laos had a war. Uh, number two, it's the fastest growing economy in Asia, grew faster than China last year. Number three, it's the most socially networked country in Asia. It's a percentage of the internet users. In fact, not only the most socially networked country in Asia, it's the most socially networked country on the planet. As a percentage of internet users, more people are on Twitter and Facebook than any other country on the planet. So we have a young, fast-growing, dynamic, uh, English-speaking population that is very socially networked. That's a good starting ground to start off with. So we took that foundation and we uh, at, at Globe um, thought that's the best place to start when it start connecting the millions and millions of people in the Philippines that are not on the internet. Um, and at Globe, 
um, we, uh, we, we decided to take a pretty radical approach. Uh, and we took a radical approach first in the most fundamental things where there's many booths and stuff like that out there. That's in our network. Because at the end of the day, if you don't have a great network, um, the customer experience won't be there to connect those other people. So, so several years ago, as part of a broader transformation, um, we threw out our whole network. We literally threw it out. It's in, it's in Africa somewhere, I believe. Um, we wrote off $300 million and we spent $700 million. Every last nook and cranny is HSPA+. Plus. Every last barangay, every last village, it's an all IP network. We rolled out 12,000 kilometers of fiber. 3G everywhere and a very large LTE rollout as well. Um, we're one of the few carriers in our GDP cohort that have already done that. Interestingly, our business case was, yes, about data growth, but it was also about power savings, utility savings, simplifying the network, um, uh, and, uh, and a lot of the overhead that comes from legacy complex networks. So when we thought we built that network, we thought, that's it. Okay, we've got, we've got this great population, it's fast growing, and now we've built this great network. Here it comes. And we found, actually, our data growth was just like all of us in the room. Right? Bit by bit, yes, it looks big on the paper, but then you look at the vast millions of people who aren't coming online yet. And then we started thinking, well, we've got to do something radically different on the service front. We've got to introduce them to the internet in a very different way. Yes, they're at internet cafes, and many are not even at internet cafes. So what we started on the journey to do is actually redesign the customer experiences with services and outlooks that can introduce them at low or no cost. Uh, going back several years, we were the global launch customer for Google Free Zone. We built that product with them from scratch. Learned a lot through that journey. It was moderately successful. We took those learnings, we iterated and iterated. As we went along, we started challenging ourselves more and more. We said, what is it going to take to double, triple our data users? Not at our five-year, seven-year horizon like our LTE and 3G business case was, but in 18 months, in 24 months. What will it take? We were fortunate enough to come across a, a company in California called Facebook. It had the same vision as us. What would it take to do something radically different? So we started that journey. And we designed an end-to-end -end customer experience, not just about zero rating, but actually an immersive customer experience. We're in the Facebook experience. You can buy data packs, one click. You can sign up. You know exactly when you leave and click on a link that you won't be charged because we tell you. Um, and it's across all the platforms and deeply, deeply integrated with what we do. We launched 3G originally, our original version of 3G in 2006. Uh, in the fourth, and in those seven years that we took to build 3G out, in the last 90 days, we doubled our mobile internet users. Um, in the fourth quarter, our overall revenues hit record revenues. Now, this journey's not finished. I don't have all the answers on what happens next. We have lots of challenges. Um, but we've moved the needle uh, in the fourth quarter. Um, we've had to make some really large decisions and bets, but we found partners along the way, great partners along the way. And we do believe that the elements are in place in the ecosystem to make a difference and bring the next few billion people online. We hope next time this year we can come back and tell you the end of the story. Thank you.